Get your advanced copy of my new book, The Body and the Cosmos at NadiaShaw.com. Hello, fabulous friends, fans, and superstars. Welcome to your horoscope for the week of September 29, 2019. I am your astrologer, Nadia Shaw. Thank you for being here. What an amazing week it is. We have an active and fabulous sky playing out for us right now. And really the star of the show, the main attraction this week is Pluto going direct. Now this happens right around Thursday, give or take a day on either side, depending on where you are on the planet. But Really, this energy is active all week, and that is because Pluto will be what we call stationary, appearing to stand still in the sky. And when it is that Pluto is about to change directions, it is closer to the Earth than it may otherwise be. And this is a powerful symbol here of the strength of its energies and how much it is that we are going to be feeling this. Pluto, of course, is known uh, to be a symbol of transformation, of metamorphosis, that's sort of in its higher expression. But of course, there are other layers of expression to Pluto. Pluto is, after all, uh, named after the god of the underworld. And if you think about it, like in, in symbolism, in mythologies, again and again, we see whenever it is that there is a journey to the underworld, it involves... Uh, having to look at things that are difficult to look at. It involves feelings of discomfort at the very least. And sometimes we are shown our own shadow in particular. And that is a huge role that Pluto plays. Uh, wherever Pluto is in a chart, for example, we reach a decision point. And I have found this to be true, whether it is by transit. So because Pluto transits are so slow, it takes a full 260 years for Pluto to go all the way around the zodiac. So we'll spend a nice long time in each sign that it's in. And uh, it is not the case yet, or right now anyways, uh, that we live for 260 years. So it is not the case that we, in this current incarnation, are going to live through an entire uh, Pluto cycle or that we'll have our Pluto return the way that we have other uh, planets come back to where they were when we were born. And so as part of this lifetime, since 2008, we have had Pluto moving through the sign of Capricorn, but you know there are people alive right now who have Pluto and other signs as well. And of course, depending on your birth chart, you'll have Pluto in its own house as well, uh, uniquely for you in your chart. Wherever Pluto is in your sky, in your chart, it is an area of life where a complete reversal becomes possible. And there tends to uh, come a point Pluto, as I said, can represent a lot of higher qualities like transformation and metamorphosis and being a force of transformation. But what I found is that is something that often has to be chosen. That is part of the gift. Often it is said that wherever Pluto is in a chart, all else being equal, I always like to say that, right? This can be offset by a lot of harmonious uh, aspects to Pluto, but in general, wherever Pluto is in your chart, chances are, especially in earlier life, there was uh, some experiences there that might have felt painful, that might have felt like there were powers greater uh, than yourself, that might have felt as if things were unfair or unjust in some way. And the default with Pluto is to go to that place, to, to take that on as a role model and to perpetuate those particular, um, those particular things that were model to us that were part of what facilitated pain especially in early life and what i have found is that there tends to be a moment maybe some aspect is happening in the chart but at some point in a life what happens is we are invited to choose and we get to choose we're going to elevate that energy and be a force of transformation and a force of facilitating healthy, uh, enlightened awareness and metamorphosis for ourselves and in others in that very area of life, or we will choose to perpetuate the cycle. We will choose to return what it was that we felt was given to us, return the unfairness that we felt was given to us. 
And in this way, Pluto, as much as it is about the shadow and what we don't want to acknowledge as a part of us, what we can sometimes even project onto other people. At the same time though, Pluto is in its own way, a part of becoming enlightened, right? As we understand enlightenment in new age circles, this understanding of enlightenment has to do with being aware, being conscious, being aware of our own emotional reactions, deciding on principles that are going to guide our life and choosing them as much as possible. This is the journey towards what I like to call greater love and greater wisdom and to move in that direction, that direction of enlightenment or so-called enlightenment. Often it involves moving through pain. In fact, it is often the case. I've also found that it is the people who have gone through experiences that are especially challenging, that are also those who are most adamant about aligning with greater love and greater wisdom. And that's where we see Pluto at its very best, right? That's when that Plutonian energy can be harnessed. This is a, a planet that speaks to the alchemical process after all. Alchemy is the ancient practice of turning lead into gold. Now, this was of course a physical pursuit that a lot of people in the ancient world undertook. There's a lot of texts that we see that come out of different parts of the world. I'm thinking about ancient Greece, I'm thinking about the Arab world where we have a lot of texts of people exploring this idea, talking about their experiments, wanting to turn lead into gold. But of course, this is a, a metaphorical process, especially now in our modern world, we've come to understand as we have explored archetypes more deeply, uncovered archetypes more deeply, we can see that the alchemical process is to take that thing in your own life that has felt so heavy, that has felt so burdened, that has felt like lead weighing you down, holding you down and turning that into something of, of great value, of great wealth, of great treasure. It is the treasure that we discover within once we move beyond the lead, once we move beyond the pain. And so this tends to be the case in the natal chart. During a transit, a nice long uh, Plutonian transit, right? For example, Pluto and Capricorn. This energy has been taking place since 2008 and will take place right into the middle of the next decade. It's right around 2023, 2024. That is when the energy will start to shift as Pluto leaves the sign of Capricorn. But it is during this time that all of us will have Pluto moving through a different part of our sky. Whether you wanna use your natal chart, whether you wanna use um, your solar chart, uh, which is what horoscopes are often based on. But when we look at it, especially from a whole signs perspective, each of us, depending on our sign, is, is going on this journey, this adventure that started back in 2008 and will continue for another few years. We're about two thirds of the way in now. And during this journey, we will get to look at where it is that there has been pain for us, where it is that maybe we felt things were unjust and we will get a chance to turn it around or at least to see it differently, to appreciate it differently. We will get a chance to take what it is that has felt like a burden, that has felt heavy, that has felt like lead and turn it into something of great value to become a force of transformation in that very area of life. Now, sometimes that transformation is for you. It's only for you and that's okay. That's valuable as well. And sometimes we can take that transformation and it starts with us, but then we're able to translate that. We're able to use that as a jumping off point and use that transformation to actually facilitate transformation in other people as well. And I think that's when Pluto and Plutonian energy starts to uh, work in its highest understanding. Pluto speaks very powerfully to generations as well. Like for example, the people born right around now, right since 2008 are born with Pluto in the sign of Capricorn. And uh, this is something I've certainly spoken about, you know, over the years uh, that I've been on YouTube or even on my own website as well as an astrologer, as a full-time astrologer. We are understanding power differently. We are seeing to the core of power, but more than that, and the thing that I've been noticing lately 
if I may say, and I've been resisting saying this, I might edit it out. But one thing that I'm noticing is that uh, especially, you know, I think as astrologers, and, and thankfully there are those of us who recognize um, the need for ethics, right? The need for uh, a certain responsibility, because even though since the discovery of Uranus, in our modern world, it has been astrology that has, you know, sort of gone the realm of a, a different space than before. And so astrology was very intricately linked to astronomy up until the discovery of Uranus. And uh, that took place in the late 1700s. And after that point, it was like the definition of science changed. It became something else. So before then, you couldn't be a scientist or an astronomer or a, uh, any kind of person who contemplated the physical world and wanted to learn about the physical world without also contemplating the deeper spiritual and symbolic significance. And this is why, for example, with Ptolemy, Ptolemy uh, has written textbooks that are still a part of astronomy uh, programs in universities to this day and also wrote the foundational text to uh, Western astrology as well. That would have been very normal for his time. But now it's not as common, right? It's not as common for someone to be an astronomer, to dive into the science of it, uh, but also be an astrologer with the same enthusiasm. Or at least if they are, they, uh, they may not show it as much, right? There's this distinction that's made. And so, yes, astrology and astronomy became a, a separate thing. And astrology didn't really know where to go because it was uh, the definition of science had changed. And so it was no longer considered a science. And it was with the discovery of Neptune that astrology then found a home within the New Age movement. That's why to this day, astrology is considered uh, New Age. And of course, with the discovery of Pluto, in, uh, in the early 1900s that uh, astrology started to merge with psychology that much more. And so astrology, yes, has, has continued to evolve. And I think that it is uh, one of those things that I've seen. Everyone comes to astrology for their own reasons. And, you know, the sky is impartial. The sky just is. And you can't have astrology without the astrologer. And whoever you are as an astrologer, or rather whoever you are as a person, whatever you believe about the world, that is gonna show up in terms of how you interpret the sky. And it's also gonna show up in terms of, you know, what you want out of astrology, how you approach the astrology chart or the calculations that you're drawn to. And so someone who's very, like for example, very mathematical, very left brain oriented, um, they're going to look for an astrology system with a lot of formulas to it. Someone who's more poetic is going to focus more on the actual symbolism and, and diving in on that level. So I guess because of the kind of astrologer that I am, I tend to come across astrologers who have the best of intentions, right? We want to put good energy in the world. We want to uh, be part of love and wisdom in the world. Of course, we all say it in our own way. But ultimately, it's a part of affirming uh, the best that we are, the best that we could be, the best possibilities, which is wonderful, which is great. The intention is great, but I think that sometimes we lose something when we don't also acknowledge that as part of the world that we have created, we have a variety of expression, a variety of experience. And the discovery of Pluto, to me, represents our willingness as humanity to look at our shadow more deeply, to acknowledge and honor the shadow. And by honor, I don't mean that you let it rain and you say, oh, well, that's the shadow, that's my shadow, come out and play, <laughs> but rather that we're willing to heal it, right? At least we're willing to see it. At least we're willing to do the work, or at least some of us are, and more and more of us are being called to do that work, which I find very inspiring. But the shadow necessarily means what it is that we want to deny, that we don't want to look at, and often because it is painful. And what Pluto, representing the god of the underworld, the underworld is dark, right? It is a dark place. In mythology, 
we have a lot of um, examples and descriptions of how it is that in the underworld people experience pain you know or you know as soon as you went to the underworld there was no longer life there was no longer thriving I was thinking about uh, the story of Hades and Persephone right and Ceres as well this is actually a story that I, I talk quite a bit about in the decade ahead horoscope I'll try to link to that in the description below but I did dive into that myth in particular in that video because there's this idea that when life goes to the underworld goes to Pluto there is loss there is grieving there is suffering and so one thing that I'm seeing and I say this with so much love I say this with so much humility but one thing that I, I have noticed some astrologers saying is that uh, you know something to the effect that oh Pluto moving into Aquarius this is going to bring uh, you know this dawn of a new age where it comes to astrology and astrology is going to be uplifted it's going to be this and that and I have felt that by emphasizing that by saying that it's kind of like not really understanding the nature of Pluto yes when Pluto moves into Aquarius in the middle of the next decade is going to align uh, in supreme harmony with Uranus that's great right that's a real lift of an energy there but if you think about Pluto right Pluto makes us look at what we don't want to look at it it brings out the dark side it, it brings out what it is that we reject you know it, it brings pain forward now that pain comes forward to be healed as part of greater love as part of greater wisdom I mentioned earlier the the myth of Hades and Persephone well the thing is that in some myths Persephone is kidnapped by by Hades and it is Ceres her mother that mourns this loss and that is what uh, leads to uh, suffering on earth mainly because Ceres rules the seasons and because she rules the seasons um, when her daughter goes she's so sad that she can't keep the earth thriving and that's why there's fall and then there's winter and so there's a compromise reached that okay half the year you get to have your daughter and half the year Hades gets to have your daughter and that is uh, one mythological way of understanding how the seasons were created but there's one thing that um, I think in some myths is sometimes overlooked and that is the telling of the myth where Persephone goes willingly with Hades Persephone falls in love with Hades she wants to be with Hades it isn't that she's kidnapped and forced to go to the underworld but she's drawn to the underworld and it is love that draws her to the underworld I think that is a very powerful symbol this idea that we as human beings are drawn to our own dark side are meant to go to our dark side we're meant to dive in and really examine ourselves we're meant to look at the things that we would otherwise reject that we would otherwise project onto other people because that's what often happens with Pluto that's what often happens with the shadow is that we project it onto others we say oh look they're so bad and that's so bad right I would never be that but the truth is that there is as it said a bit of bad in the best of us and a bit of good in the worst of us and the entirety of the cosmos is in all of us which means all of that expression is within all of us as well I remember uh, about a year ago I was talking to a friend and she was talking about how she went on this trip and you know there were uh, all these drug addicts everywhere uh, when she she went to a particular big city and you know I said to her like imagine the things that needed to happen perhaps the very few things that needed to happen to separate you from that person you know the few things the the few experiences the pain the pain that couldn't be let go of the pain that consumed that led to one person making certain choices which might have just been a few it might have just been off by a little you know they talk about six degrees of separation that we have from other people from anybody else in the world they say there's six degrees of separation 
which basically means that you are six people separated from every other human being in the world, right? I think there's also like six degrees of separation, not only in terms of you physically being connected to anyone else, but also the experience of life that someone else is having. There are six degrees or less of separation that made your life and made you who you are and what you are and where you are and not that other place or person that you think is so separate from you, so different from you. And so this is also something we often do with Pluto is that uh, we project or we give it to others rather than owning that Plutonian energy. Okay, so, so here's the thing. Pluto, when Pluto moves through a sign, we have to look at what we don't want to look at. We have to look at the dark and that is hard. And that is not something that everyone is up to doing. Historically, let's just look at recent history, for example, right? I'm thinking about Pluto in Sagittarius. Did Pluto in Sagittarius, you think about what Sagittarius is, it's about the foreigner, right? It's about this, this variety of ideas and philosophies and religions and beliefs. It's about subjective truth, okay? Pluto in Sagittarius, that was 1994 to 2008. That wasn't some enlightened time of, of unity between different cultures and different people. Yes, in, in some ways it created more interactions between people who were very different, maybe hadn't and interacted before, hadn't been aware of each other before. Sagittarius is also an energy of politics as well. But it isn't that we saw unity. In fact, what we saw was sort of the dark side of faith. We saw an increase of, of separation. We saw uh, people made other much more adamantly, right? We saw uh, how uh, political beliefs and politics could be used to create pain in the world, how religion can be used to create pain in the world. The same things that have brought people together, brought great harmony, brought great love, right? That's part of Neptune. Neptune brings that sense of unity. Uh, it brings a sense of communion, rather. Whereas Neptune brings that communion, it is Pluto that makes things very stark, that makes it hard to look at ourselves and easier to point fingers. You know, unfortunately, this is the world that we've created. And I want to honor this, right? I want to, I, I want to honor it because the truth is that there are a lot of people who go through really painful experiences, who go through unjust experiences. But then there are people who are able to take that and become more loving and become more wise. And that's a healthy way to use Pluto. You think about how many people became more adamant to become more unifying, to understand other cultures, to understand each other, it became much easier to travel to other countries during Pluto moving through Sagittarius. And so we've seen that. We've seen a lot of barriers broken because of that, because of that cycle. We saw people become so separate, so afraid, and then reject it and choose unity, choose to see each other in each other even if the surface was different. And that was the blessing, that was the gift, that was the transformative energy, the higher energy of Pluto. As much as it made us see things that were uh, very difficult to look at, it also made us more honest. And in being more honest, we became more loving, we became more wise. Now think about Pluto in Scorpio. Pluto in Scorpio didn't bring like an enlightenment where it came to intimacy, for example. Um, we didn't have a choice. We had to look at it because we were realizing, like on the one hand, I mean, I'm thinking about uh, STDs. It became much more in focus. Uh, that was when AIDS entered uh, into the world as well. And it wasn't just like AIDS being Pluto and Scorpio, but it was also the way in which society chose to, to stigmatize and make others uh, the first people who contracted that disease, among which were teachers of mine who were deeply meaningful to me. That was the darkness, right? It wasn't necessarily just the disease. 
It was the way in which people reacted that made them have to look at themselves if they were willing, right? That had to look at their own prejudices. Pluto in Libra, right? This is where we saw relationships and, and this is where divorce got a lot easier as well. And we started looking at and having to address things like domestic violence. And that was when that really started to come into focus. Before then, we weren't even looking at it. We weren't even talking about it as a collective. But it was Pluto in the sign of Libra that started bringing that much more to the forefront, where we had to look at the power dynamics within relationships, not just in terms of domestic violence, but also uh, this was when we had to look at uh, the, the financial agreements, you know, what happens when marriages end and, and how things are shared, how resources are shared or not. And that was something that we as a collective were having to look at what, what wasn't working or rather um, how unfair things could be. And so I'm looking at Pluto moving into Aquarius and of course we hope for and we connect with the best. We, with our decision, can be forces of transformation. And the more of us that do that, the more we elevate that energy, right? Because there is a draw to it. There is an attraction to it that we have, like Persephone to Hades. At the same time, though, we have to acknowledge that this could be a time with Pluto moving into Aquarius. This could be a time when we as astrologers, because Aquarius is so connected to uh, astrology, this could be a time when we as astrologers have to look at our own dark side. We have to look at and address uh, the people maybe in our own practice who need to be more ethical, who need to understand the ethics of it more, the responsibility that comes with being an astrologer. You know, there was a time in the ancient world, I mean, I'm thinking about, for example, in ancient China, uh, if you were accused of a crime and you went to court, there was someone there practicing divination. There was someone there looking at the stars or doing the I Ching. And based on their interpretation of the sky, based on their interpretation of the I Ching, that would be a huge factor and you'd be founding guilty or innocent. That's very Pluto and Aquarius right there. I don't think that that's very fair. We have rationality for a reason. And I'll talk a lot more about Pluto and Aquarius in the years to come, but I mention this now because I think it is, it is honoring of the human experience to acknowledge the variety in which ways can, things can manifest, the ways in which things can manifest. Because when we do that, we actually see people, right? It's that sense of knowing that all of our experience is being acknowledged, that is the healing. It is simply in the act of acknowledgement, the act of sharing. Why is therapy so powerful? It's because someone else is listening to you. Like really, the, the act of saying it out loud, of raising that energy that maybe has been stuck in the lower chakras and you raise it to the higher uh, energies of rationality, of mind, of voice, when you do that, you change the energy on every other chakra, on every other level. Okay, so now Pluto is in Capricorn, right? Something that we've been talking about a lot because we are coming up in January. That triple conjunction is going to magnify this energy that much more. And this is about power, right? It's about social structures, yes, that are put into place that keep societies as they are. But it's also about power. It's about corporations. It's about ambition. Right? And this, uh, this idea of how at one time before we used to idealize people who were ruthless, right? But now we're seeing what that actually means, what that actually entails. And so Pluto going direct now, right? While squaring Venus and Venus in the sign of Libra, uh, the energy of Libra is something I spoke about a lot last week because it is Libra that has to do with uh, diplomacy. This is diplomacy is something that I think as a collective, and the media certainly has been talking about a lot lately. It has to do with relating. It has to do with balance. Yes, cooperation. It has to do with give and take. 
It has to do with how we relate to each other personally, but also um, relate to each other professionally, relate to each other as companies, relate to each other as countries, as different cultures, how we relate to each other as well. It has to do with two differing, whether you want to call it forces or energies or beings or entities, finding a way to connect and communicate and figuring out what that means, right? trying to understand what it is that one side thinks is fair and balanced and what the other side thinks, which can sometimes be two very different things. So here's Venus in its home sign of Libra, strong placement. And here, Venus likes to contemplate, right? Likes to seek beauty in all forms and all things, likes symmetry. And we're being encouraged to find symmetry, to find beauty, the beauty of ideas, of, of principles, of ideals. These are all very Venus in the sign of Libra. And then you have Pluto at its max power right now in the sign of power and who has the power. Speaking with, with Venus in a connection of tension. Now that is not an easy energy because this makes us aware, more acutely aware of power dynamics that play out whenever it is that we relate to another. Again, whether it is globally, whether it is culturally and individually as well. There can often be, and there are some philosophical schools of thought that think that there are always power dynamics playing out in any interaction that we may have with another. And so in that context, what does fairness mean? How can fairness reign in the face of or while interacting with huge power forces or an imbalance of power, significant imbalances of power that can be there? Now, this is also to speak of within ourselves because we are complex and uh, people with a lot of variety to us. And so within ourselves as well, we may have two sides of us or more, but let's say two sides that have very different desires, that have very different needs. And as part of this, we may feel restricted or we may feel as if we are having to acknowledge factors that are larger than ourselves, that are beyond our control as part of trying to honor and acknowledge and find balance between two different parts of us. So one example, the part of us that likes to have fun, right? For some people, that can be a very different part and what fun is is so different from the part of us that goes to work, for example. I recently had an experience where I was uh, taking a class in downtown Toronto for a full week and it was nine to five, nine in the morning to five in the, the evening. And I haven't done a nine to five in so many years, I can't even tell you. And what was incredible to me, like as I, I undertook this journey, because it's never about what you think, right? It's not about what you learn in the class. It's about the whole experience, how it shapes you. Just like I like to say, it's not about the degree, it's about who you become in the process. And so one thing that was amazing to me was when I, you know, the first day I sort of was, didn't want my headphones in, I wanted to walk in the morning and take in the environment and be part of the energy. That only lasted about a day <laughs> because as I embarked on the second day, I saw how people around me in a big city, you kind of need headphones. It's a form of protection. It's a kind of armor from so many different energies coming from around you. But it's also a way to focus yourself on what it is you need to do when you have a variety of desires and needs working within you. So I had a desire to keep sleeping, for example. That was one part of me, right? I had a desire to just, you know, do what it is that I do, what I'm good at with astrology and, and to delve into that more, to emphasize that more. I had that desire, but at the same time, I was having to look at this whole new thing and this whole new system and be challenged in new ways that weren't always comfortable. And I saw this in a lot of people. I saw a lot of people by the last day, I was on automatic. I kind of knew where I had to walk. I had knew what song I was gonna to listen to that's gonna get me there in the right amount of time. And I saw this in a lot of people just kind of on automatic. And I understood why in a much deeper way than I had before. 
If you're lucky, you're doing work that you find fulfilling, that's fun for you, where you're able to bring your whole self and be nourished. But that's not the case for a lot of people. And so as part of this, you know, you look at power, you look at what is needed, what you have to do, what the structures are that may feel bigger than yourself, that may feel unfair, but then there's, you know, what you love, being in the moment. Sometimes they work well together, sometimes they don't. And that's okay, that's a part of life. As part of any life, you are gonna have moments of choosing delayed gratification. Now, delayed gratification is more of a Saturnian principle, so we'll dive into that another day, but with Pluto, there is that awareness as well of needing to take some time, understanding what's going to be most meaningful, understanding what really matters at the core and working to change things from that level, from the inside out and understanding that that's where the power is. That's what truly ultimately allows us to be that force of transformation in our lives and in the lives of others. And however it is that that comes up, whatever compromises sometimes need to be made to move ourselves there, well, it is Venus speaking with Pluto that may bring that to the surface, along with our own desire to make those compromises, to have that deeper understanding. Again, whether it's with others or within ourselves as well. Now, what we also have happening this week, other big energies include Mars changing signs. And so that happens right around the end of the week. Mars will change signs, move into the sign of Libra. And this is where Venus is right now, but Mars is a very different energy, right? Uh, Mars is a much more independent, much more active principle. And as Mars moves into this part of the sky, it can make our alliances, our exchanges, our relationships as well, more passionate, right? That is one way, the higher end of this uh, manifesting. People can motivate us, encourage us to be more determined and more focused. Again, that's one way this energy can manifest. But of course, this is Mars, right? Likes to get us to feel something. And, and chances are some of our exchanges with others uh, will be that, that get us in touch with our own feelings, our own emotions, our own passions as well. And exchanges can become more passionate under this energy also. Now Mars will be here for the next month and a half, so a nice long stay. And it is going to give us all the opportunity to understand our own power where it comes to relating to another. I actually think of Mars as intimately connected with the serenity affirmation. And wherever Mars goes, we are invited to utilize the serenity affirmation on the one hand, maybe consciously, uh, but also to live it. And so the serenity affirmation is grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, which is an action, which is a place of power, the courage to change the things I can. So again, that is a, the more active principle of Mars and the wisdom to know the difference. The cultivation of wisdom is also an act. It is a, an action that comes from self-knowledge. The, the circle of Mars representing completeness and wholeness and self-knowledge and acting from that place is the arrow that arises from the glyph of Mars, from the circle of that glyph. And so in our relationships and our relating to others, we are gonna be invited to look at where we have control and where we don't. And here's the thing, the truth is, we have no control over anyone else, ever. People will do all kinds of things for all kinds of reasons that have nothing to do with you. That maybe on the surface look like they have to do with you, but they really don't, in my humble opinion. Because you could do one thing and one person could find it the cutest, most amazing, most uh, loving, endearing thing. You could do the exact same thing to another person and they may not feel that way. They may have the complete opposite reaction. Either way, their reaction is not about you, right? Especially when it is that you are wanting to be rooted in love and wisdom. When your intention is arising from love and wisdom, it makes it that much more obvious that whatever other people do is not necessarily about you. 
it's about them and all the things they experienced and how they interpreted it that brought them to this very moment of interaction with you. And that determines ultimately their choices and their reactions and their decisions. It's not about you. And I think that is part of the power of this time. Now, the other big news this week is Mercury moving into the sign of Scorpio in the first part of the week. This is important for a few reasons. So one is Mercury moving into Scorpio. That in and of itself is about talking about what's really going on, seeing behind illusions. Scorpio is the ruling planet of Pluto. And I think these energies are actually going to work together really well in that they are going to allow us to bring language, bring words, bring insight into what may be happening that we don't want to look at, into what it is that uh, perhaps we're holding close or we don't feel safe to talk about just yet. It allows us to talk about those things that we don't normally want to look at, what we reject, what we project as well. It allows us to bring words to the shadow, to raise the energy, as I spoke of earlier, to take what's feeling and, and in the lower chakras and raise it so that it transforms, it becomes more enlightened and lighter as a result. But what makes this significant as well is that it is going to be at the end of next week that Mercury will enter shadow. November is a big Mercury retrograde month. And so we are going to have an unusually long transit of Mercury moving through the sign of Scorpio. It's going to be over two months of this energy. Right into December, we will have Mercury moving through the sign of Scorpio. And so this is going to be interesting for a few reasons. One is it's going to give us a chance to really talk it out, to really dive in, to give words to what it is that we don't want to look at even within ourselves much less in others. The secrets that we consciously keep is part of what Scorpion energy is about. I think as a collective, when we look at Mercury, Mercury rules the media, right? It's what we're talking about as a collective. And I do think that Scorpio being connected to power is going to allow us to bring the collective conversation more towards understanding power bringing words, bringing uh, intellectual understanding, bringing insight, right? And you think about what's called investigative reporting. We are really going to see that quite a bit sort of kick up and the importance of that being emphasized in the weeks and, and months ahead as well. But also taking another look, taking a deeper look, thanks to that Mercury retrograde. Now, with Scorpio, it also has to do with financial agreements, right? And financial settlements, for example. And so I also want to mention this now because if there are important financial documents that need to be signed, I would encourage you, if possible, try to do that this week or next week because after that, Mercury will go into shadow. And of course, you want to trust your life. It's going to be whatever it is that it needs to be. However, once it is that Mercury enters shadow, and especially once it is that Mercury goes retrograde, uh, what can sometimes happen is that uh, you may reach an agreement, but it ends up being something a little bit different, or it needs to be renegotiated, or maybe there's some fine print that wasn't seen at first. And so that's why I advise, if possible, to take care of that now or as soon as possible. However, trust your life. You know, that's always first and foremost. If things show up when they show up, you trust your life, you do what's in front of you to do and keep moving forward. What I love about this week for us, there is so much here, isn't there? There's just so much here. The big news, of course, is Pluto going forward. It is Pluto now that is the star of the sky, the star of the party. And with Pluto now moving forward this week, and starting to gain momentum, this means a few things. One is, it means that January is right around the corner with that conjunction, that very infamous, that very famous conjunction that astrologers have been talking about for years. I remember five years ago going to an astrology conference in Mexico City and someone was doing a presentation on it. 
And what was interesting is, you know, she was saying all kinds of things. She was focusing more on the lower end of Pluto, like not as much as I like to do for sure. Um, and people were like scoffing at her and everything. And uh, now I'm seeing people like sort of say things like, oh, wow, maybe she was right. Well, let's not go there either, right? We don't want to be doom and gloom because we have choice. We participate in the unfolding of the universe. So if it is like, for example, Pluto moving into Aquarius, you know, that can be some, uh, you know, some, some sense of astrologers needing to be really mindful of their ethics, needing to be mindful of raising the energy. Because if we don't, the energy can go the other way. And so how do we address it? We make sure that we are those astrologers that raise the energy. We make sure that we are operating from a place of ethics from a place of clarity about the good that we are doing in the world and why what we do matters. We make sure that we do not allow astrology to be used uh, in a way that affirms those other energies, right? The lower end of the vibration, right? There's this term that's been coming up lately. It's called uh, astrology discrimination. And essentially what that means is if you know somebody's sign, right away you form an opinion you think that's it that's all you need to know about this person you're going to get along you won't get along no that person can't be your roommate that was a, a famous uh, meme that went around a few months back or no i'm not going to hire that person because of their sign we are so much more than our sun sign that is so short-sighted <laughs> to think that way right this is a way that astrology can be used that is not enlightened when we just break it down so simple and say, okay, everybody, if you're of this zodiac sign, uh, you're much more likely to do bad things or you're much more likely to do good things. Either one or the opposite side of the same coin. So we make sure that we don't do that starting right now so that when we get there, when it is that we are asked about our ethics, we make sure that we are grounded, we are rooted in a history of years because we've still got a few years to go till we get there but we're rooted in a history of years of showing our clients, our customers, our audience, our friends, our family, our sphere of influence, that we operate from a place of integrity. Because that's the thing, integrity is rewarded with Pluto. It can be. Now, sometimes you gotta you know, navigate through a difficult transit before you get to that reward, but the reward does come. Pluto is also God of wealth, right? and acknowledging and being able to see all the different ways in which we are wealthy. And so right now, we start moving towards that exact conjunction that I spoke a lot about in the Decade Ahead horoscope that I will be speaking a lot about in the weeks and months ahead as well. But for now, as Pluto moves forward, the great blessing is momentum. The great blessing is honesty and ownership and clarity being able to see how it is that we have been not owning fully our own projections where it is that we have not been willing to see ourselves and others but rather have been so focused on the separation of self from others whoever they may be it is Pluto moving forward now that is going to invite us to appreciate, to see those degrees of separation because we really are mirrors. We really are just like each other. Where it really matters, we are each other. And it is Pluto moving forward now that's gonna help us to own our power to see this very truth and to get to our own truth. What is at the core of you? What is at the center of you? And if you can define that in terms rooted in love and wisdom, then you're on the right track. Well, thank you so much for watching. What do you love about this week? Let me know in the comments below. I absolutely love reading you guys. 
And of course, if you want to know how all this wonderful stuff this week, including Pluto Direct, how it speaks to you and your sign, log on to NadiaShaw.com, sign up to be one of my superstars. The superstars get expanded exclusive video scopes each and every week, unlimited access to special horoscopes, and so much more. All of this in the superstar space. I look forward to meeting you there. And thank you to my superstars, my very cherished superstars. We had a recent hangout that was a lot of fun. Uh, we do a live meditation every month as well in alignment with the new moon. And that's always very rewarding as well. And it means a lot to me how much it meant to this recent meditation we did. I got a lot of feedback from superstars as to how much it meant to them. So thank you for that. And I have a new book coming out. Advanced copies are on sale just for a few more days until October 1st. You can secure an advanced copy. Uh, this book will be available on Amazon starting December 8th at noon, I believe, is when uh, the official launch is set to take place. I'll be uh, having lots of new things I'm launching right around December 8th. But this book uh, is certainly one of the big, big ones. It's called The Body and the Cosmos, and that's me, Nadia Shah. It's very exciting. If you do secure your advanced copy through my website, NadiaShaw.com, before October 1st, October 1st, I hope I said that right, October 1st, in just a few days from the start of the week. Um, but it is October 1st that the order goes into the printer, but if you secure an advanced copy, you do get a bunch of free gifts with it. So one of the free gifts is this beautiful pendant. It is a silver plated pendant. Uh, so you will get that shipped to you with this book. Um, what you also get is this book contains meditations and um, every sign has its own meditation to it. I explore each and every sign. I use a, a book by Plato called Timaeus as a jumping off point to explore our connection with the cosmos and how each sign is connected uh, to different spiritual principles and physical uh, parts of our body as well. And so each sign has meditations to it and those meditations will be recorded, are being recorded right now and so you get those digital downloads, 12 meditations that will sell for $19.95. You will get them uh, before Halloween. This book will be shipped before Halloween as well. And you will get a handwritten note by me. A lot of people have ordered this so far. Thank you so much. I am going to be writing note cards. I know it. I, I'm going to have to go home and get a big box of note cards and write them. Um, and I thank you. I thank each and every one of you who have ordered an advanced copy. You can either go on my website right now and you can read a preview. The whole introductory chapter is there um, on my website. And so I hope that you enjoy it, whether you're waiting for it to come on Amazon, or you decide to get the advanced copy. Again, I appreciate you. And again, it's only for a few more days until October 1st. After that, uh, I will be focusing more on getting things published on, on Amazon. So that'll be fun as well. And I have lots of events coming up that's very exciting. I have Synchronicity University starting right around the corner, like right around the corner. I think it's starting in about two weeks. Um, and that's gonna be great. We are gonna have so much fun together as we uh, enter the autumn session of Synchronicity University. Classes are going to include Jupiter through the signs and houses. That's one class. Uh, we'll have two more classes on astrological magic that build on uh, the last session and the class we did then. And that's going to be leading up to Halloween. And then we are going to have a class on Pluto through the signs and houses. I touched on that a little bit earlier, but I'm going to go through each sign in each house so you understand Pluto in your own chart. And we are going to have an introduction to electional astrology, which is the astrology of the, you know, starting something new, the right time. You know, a lot of times people will come to an astrologer and say, help me find a wedding date. Or they'll say, uh, you know, what date should I start a business? So we'll be looking at some basic principles to help you to get started on choosing the best date for whatever it is that you desire to do. So all of that is going to be online. I'll be teaching online. We've got lots of people signed up. Uh, even more than before. I think almost 300 people are signed up so far. So thank you so much to all my amazing students. I appreciate each and every one of you and your trust and your love, all of it. Thank you. And so you can log on to synchronicityuniversity.com. Choose one, choose all, choose the whole pack. Uh, you would be very welcome. And I look forward to meeting you in class. 
and in-person events of course i have uh, a big event coming up with the cruise event but just before the cruise leaves from fort lauderdale i'm actually going to be speaking in fort lauderdale at the ncgr group there uh, that is saturday i think that's the january 11 saturday january the 11 um, and i will be doing two uh, talks so the morning talk is called From Earth to Air, and it's looking at the 2020s, diving into the 2020s uh, for a few hours. And then in the afternoon, we are going to have a workshop on past lives in the astrology chart. So all of that is gonna be so interesting. I'm looking forward to meeting Florida friends and fans uh, in person. I will have copies of this book available. I'll be signing them. Yeah, if you buy the advanced copy, you also get a signed copy as well. Uh, but I will be signing copies of this book and having a few of them for sale uh, in Florida, in Fort Lauderdale. So it'll be a lot of fun. I look forward to meeting uh, Florida friends and fans. And then January 12th, is when we set sail on this uh, cruise event. Thank you so much to all the people who have already signed up, uh, whether you've signed up through the other astrologers or through me. Uh, as of this week, last week, people have still been signing up. And so uh, I know that the price is gonna be going up very soon uh, for the seminar fee. So if it is that you'd like to join us, this would be a good time for you to investigate, to look into that. Links are in the description below. But it really is about uh, facilitating an experience on board, sharing a karmic journey together. And I'm a participant, I'm leading some of the seminars, but I'm also a participant. I'll be going on this journey with you. And I do believe it will be a transformative journey. It will leave us changed in some way. This event is happening under the light of the Pluto-Saturn conjunction, exact conjunction. And I think that's a powerful symbol for us reclaiming our power, understanding the core of our power to be forces of transformation in our lives and within our sphere of influence as well, and so many other things. Uh, it will be a very rewarding experience. Um, it will be a karmic experience, and I think that's always rewarding. So if you'd like to learn more about that or sign up, all the links are in the description below, and I look forward to meeting you on board. Other upcoming events coming up in 2020. My calendar is filling up mighty, mighty fast. Um, I'm going to be in Istanbul. I'm going to be in Seattle. I'm going to be in Colorado. Um, and there's lots of other events as well. That's off the top of my head. I'm going to be in Toronto in May as well. So that'll be really exciting to be back in my hometown and teaching with Astrology Toronto. And so I'll continue to give you information, but if you can't wait, if you really want to see what I'm doing, uh, you can click on the description uh, below, the link in the description below, and that will take you to my events page where my events are constantly updated as new events are added. And thank you. Thank you to all the amazing people organizing events. Thank you for hosting me. Um, and of course, for this moment with you guys, thank you. Thank you for seeing me as some small part of your sacred journey. Um, this book, The Body and the Cosmos, it's a really big deal. It means so much to me, uh, very near and dear to my heart. And uh, the support and the love that you guys have shown for this book so far, I'm just so, so very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you for your trust. And again, thank you for watching. It'll be a great week. Enjoy.